comment, a uh, PhD candidate here in, in English. Um, I'm just going to introduce our panelists for the day and let them uh, present for us, and then we'll have Q&A after. Um, so today our panelists are um, Carmen Murport. So Carmen is a PhD candidate in the University of Chicago English Department. Her field of study and published works have to do with 20th century American literature and visual culture, uh, affect theory, contemporary art history, and cultural studies. Um, Delara O'Neill. Uh, Delara is an MA in liberal studies from the New School for Social Research, and her writing is forthcoming in California Review of Images and N Plus One. And finally, um, Anna Vital. Anna is a poet, scholar, and performer. She earned a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and an MFA in writing from Bard College. She is the author of Detroit, Detroit, Different Wor Words, Unknown Pleasures, and Anna Vital's Pop Poems. Uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists. Uh, Carmen, we'll start us off. I just couldn't help myself. Um, the first is from a Renee Gladman piece called The Person in the World. Prose, to risk a definition, is the registering of the everyday, the phenomenon of life, of being in life, using a kind of heightened language, thus a heightened consciousness of oneself in language, alongside a materialization of that activity in the form of characters, splinters, and events, narrative. Prose moves across genres, practices of thought, cultures, realities, bringing to both the writer's and the reader's attention the blurred yet visible borders between them. The second quote is from a 1997 Vogue article by scholar Elaine Schulter entitled, The Professor War Prada. I know label feminists who can tell you the shortest route from the school of criticism theory to the Armani outlet. I know kitsch feminists, like the critic Jane Gallup, who lectures in symbolic outfits such as a skirt made out of men's ties. I know diva feminists who make power dressing political, like Duke University professor Eve Sophie Sedgwick, who told a conference audience that she had dreamed of a store full of luscious looking clothes, all in her size, and then saw they carried a pink triangle instead of a price tag. I've heard about Voyage from Erica Jong, even in 1997, according to Ms. Mentor, the feminist academic, academics version of Ms. Manners, the best clothes for a professional academic to wear to a big-time academic conference are dresses or skirts that no one will notice or remember. Young feminists should dress in a mature, even slightly frumpy manner. After the age of 30, they should aim for one of the three E's, earthy, ethnic, or elegant. <laughs> um, this is still the advice column for the Chronicle of Higher Ed. In this paper, I will very gesturally claim that the works of Kathy Acker and Chris Krauss show us the ways in which what Gladman calls the material reach of prose can be exploited so that it effectively reconfigures the blurred yet visible boundaries or borders between writer and reader. But of course, this is not just a question of a single writer and a single reader. Like many of the authors we're discussing under the banner of new narrative, um, but also in their own unique fashions, Acker and Krauss reconfigure the borders between writers and readers plural, between embodied collectivities. <clears throat> um, to get at some of the, the particularities um, that distinguish Acker and Krauss, um, and to suggest points of overlap between them, my aim today is to describe how these authors take on collective bodies by invoking distinct sets of social relations having to do with the mass public sphere and with the art world. And when I say they take on these bodies, I mean it in the multiple senses of adopting, of combating, of embracing, of denouncing. 
Something I love about the new narrative writing I've discovered is that it does not exhaust itself in the creation of a counter-public like so much avant-garde activity does. Sorry, that's a text from my roommate. <laughs> Rather, much of this writing sets into motion a complex interplay between the dominant public and a marginalized counter-public. Kevin Killian and Dodie Bellamy, in their introduction to writers who love too much, suggest that the turn from poetry to prose fiction revealed among new narrative writers a wish, however hidden or unacknowledged, to expand one's influence in the world, that, unlike poetry, the general public read novels. Turning to the work of Acker and Krauss, one can certainly understand the conventions of the novel to be deployed in this way as a foray into the mass public sphere. Their references to the art world mean that their work speaks also to that distinct but overlapping dominant public. Despite the fact that the public sphere and the art world each operate according to different logics, both domains make use of modes of self-abstraction that privilege the embodied particularities of whiteness and maleness. It's nice to be here in this room where I can be confident that that's an uncontroversial statement. Krauss and Acker's respective appropriations of these logics do not necessarily interrupt the white supremacist patriarchal modes of abstraction that powerfully structure our ideas about publicity and aesthetic value. I wouldn't say either that their works offer alternative forms of expression and visibility exactly, not to those whose embodied particularities, objects of desire, or cultural affiliations would confine them to the margins of Anglo-European culture. Rather, the works of Krauss and Acker make felt the flows of desire the choreographed movements, the inconvenient flailings of the bodies that are sometimes brought together, sometimes pushed apart by the inequitable conventions that have for so long shaped aesthetic experience into the privileged domain we know it to be today. Outsiders are easier to come by than an outside. I've long been interested in the ways in which the constructions of authorial and artistic personae mantle or stabilize the relation between the mass cultural sphere and the more rarefied domain of high art. Uh, sorry, I mean, I guess if these texts are going to pop up, I'm going to read them to you. Um, Ingrid says, I don't want any of this. I just feel bad. <laughs> She's a grad student, too. <laughs> understanding the effects of authorial and artistic personae are crucial to understanding the stakes of experimental practices, and especially the practices of minoritarian subjects. I want to keep asking, what are the conditions necessary for an experimental artistic gesture or performance that does not abide by conventional standards of aesthetic success to become reliably legible as such, i.e. not just labeled as non-art. This question is relevant for any and all of us concerned with how our mode of self-presentation, our performances of selfhood, position us at the intersections of various fields of cultural production. What are the conditions necessary for a conference presentation that does not strive to adhere to the conventional standards of academic success to be reliably legible as an experiment? If I stand here and ask you that question, is that good enough? Um, I've recently begun to think about how the artist novel, or Künstler Roman, has been a very important site in which the minoritizing logics of the art world and the mass public sphere have, be, have been made to reinforce each other. This genre, as it has been theorized by literary scholars, has to do with the prosaic mediation of the development, formation, or special problems of the artist. Since coming into its own in the 19th century, the genre of the artist novel has contributed to the perpetuation of the masculinist myth of the artist as a romantic hero who transcends worldly matters in order to go on a solitary quest to the interior. Oh, this one's from this guy Peter, who I dated, who put on this really good front of being a feminist, but it was all a sham. Um, he says, I'm not very good at taking time off, but I'll try to teach you. I love not working so much. You wouldn't. Anyway. <laughs> As a romantic, so we're talking about the romantic hero transcending worldly matters in order to go on a solitary quest to the interior. In doing so, he discovers his identity and resolves contradictions between his spiritual and sensual sides through the creation of the artistic masterpiece. Whether this supposedly transcendent artistic persona is constructed in the mass-produced pages of a novel or a mainstream magazine, the fact that it is used to buy and sell commodities in the form of books does not diminish this formidable figure. At least when it is deployed by subjects able to claim privileged identities, that is. Where the artist's novel can be seen as the triumph of an individual creative endeavor over the compulsions of the culture industry. It makes the achievements of the traditional Anglo-European artist persona, artistic persona even more compelling, even more heroic. <laughs>
The genre of the artist novel is particularly relevant to the works of both Proust and Acker, insofar as their writings reference its conventions and its more famous instantiations. We might, for instance, recall a couple of Acker's titles here, such as The Adult Life of Toulouse Lautrec and My Death, My Life by Pierre Paolo Pasolini. While the title of Krauss's I Love Dick doesn't telegraph the relation of that text to the artist novel genre as explicitly, the broad strokes of its narrative resonate deeply with some of the most salient conventions of the artist novel. And beyond that is myriad references to the biographies of famous artists irresistibly invite the reader to compare Chris to them. Indeed, in the character of Chris, we see an image of the artist that is just as dreamy and passive, tormented and misunderstood, as the male artist traditionally depicted in books like Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man. Krauss's Chris character is arguably just as guilty of the mistakes and excesses, excesses of self-love, and just as fascinated by the vicissitudes of self-display. Here's another one from Peter. Um, I think I would be scared of public sex too, sometimes of sex in general. I like utopia, but women should be, he goes on to say, women should be in it too. Um, both Krauss and Acker, of course, take great pains to ensure that reader, the reader is not allowed to forget that the supposedly transcendent and heroic figure of the Anglo-European artist emerges at the expense of those minoritized persons who are marked by the particularities of gender, sex, race, and class, another uncontroversial statement. The creators that Nathaniel Hawthorne labeled as that damned mob of scribbling women provided the lowly collective and feminized ground against which the white male novelist as singular artistic genius could stride into view. Of course, Anglo-American conceptions having to do with hierarchies of cultural production and gender have changed over the 150 plus years since Hawthorne made his fam famous quip, but the unfortunate truth is that a great deal of these traditional patriarchal and supremacist conventions still undergird our contemporary conception of art and the artist. Thus, when the character Chris writes in I Love Dick about the great male universal artist, we just nod and we move on. When Acker was coming up many years before the fictional Chris wrote her first letter to Dick, the last gasps of literary modernism collided with feminized constructions of mass culture and gave birth to hyper-masculine figures like Norman Mailer who desperately tried to secure prestigious positions for themselves through the violent assertion of traditionally masculine qualities. Erica Jong, writing for Vogue a few years after the success of 1973's Fear of Flying, offers her take on what she calls the Mailer-esque claptrap circulating in the literary world. Quote, one of the most notable memories from my Barnard College years is the time a distinguished critic, with a capital D, came to my creative writing class and delivered himself of the following thundering judgment. Women can't be writers. They don't know blood and guts and puking in the streets and fucking whores and swaggering around through the pijal pigal at 5 a.m. End quote. John goes on to suggest that times have changed and the thing to be done is to refuse or transcend all the tenets of mythic femininity and write about what is left. Quote, it is ironic, it's ironic that Mr. Distinguished Critic should have identified blood and guts as the thing women writers supposedly lacked, because in the first years of the women's movement, there was so much blood and guts in women's writings that one wondered if women writers did anything but menstruate and rage. End quote. <laughs> Um, the answer, John suggests, is to get past the rage-making myths of femininity, to stop being distracted, and to answer the question of what the authentic voice of the woman writer is by getting in touch with oneself. Once this rather, uh, this one says, I, oh, I like writing your name. Sometimes I write it in all caps like this, Carmen. You have a great name. <laughs> Once this rather traditional quest of the interior has been accomplished, the woman writer can universalize herself and, speaking for her gender, would presumably be able to offer her reader that highly sought after aesthetic blending of the particular and the universal. Agar seems to have directly taken on Jung's, Jung's challenge. Within a year, she would copyright Blood and Guts in high school, which included what is now a well-known piece called Hello, I'm Erica Jung. Acker explodes not only Zhang's rejection of blood and guts, but also her claim to constructing a unitary identity for herself and her reader through literature. Pairing an excerpt of Deleuze and Guattari with the letter signed Erica Zhang in a round, curvy hand, the page reads, Every position of desire, no matter how small, is capable of putting into question the established order of a society, not that desire is asocial, on the contrary but it is explosive. There is no desiring machine capable of being assembled without demolishing entire social sections. Hello, I'm Erica Jong. 
All of you liked my novel, Fear of Flying, because in it you met real people. My novel contained real people, that's why you liked it. My new novel, How to Die Successfully, contains those same characters. And it contains two new characters. You and me, all of us, are real. These are from my friend Krista, who's at the airport. Um, you became an impenetrable little island who cries on Uber, now crying in Southwest Line. Someone just asked if they could cut me while I cried. Well, I've stopped crying, so. <laughs> Within a few years, the myopia and narcissism of Jong's stance would become obvious, even to the Vogue crowd. In a 1982 interview, a Vogue staff writer invites Maya Angelou to comment on the self-pitying tone of white feminists like Jong. Angelou notes that leisure, quote, leisure affords people time to be introspective and reflective. Usually black women don't have that kind of time for looking at what seem to me to be the smaller issues in life. If the woods are on fire, you don't worry if your slip is showing. You know, you, don't, you just don't have time. We are being assailed and assaulted on every level all the time." End quote. In 1982, that same year, Acker also published Hello, I'm Erica Jong as a chat book, taking on the, white, the privilege of white feminism and her assumption of that authorial persona. And again, I mean taking on in multiple senses. I'd imagine that we here all know that the myths of femininity cannot be simply be brushed aside in the interest of discovering an authentic and universal gender identity. There is, of course, the option of reclaiming these myths, including the stereotype of the female monster. She who is grotesque in her transgression of societal norms, the artist who threatens long-held conceptions of personhood and belonging. And I love Dick in the passage from which the title of our panel comes. Chris muses that female monsters, like the artist Hannah Wilk, seeks to study the facts, to become a mindless machine or single-minded blob capable of voraciously taking in everything, getting to the bottom of all things, including the personal, including the self. In many ways, this appetite resonates with the traditional role of the artist, whose self-involved practice would bring together the particular and the general, just without all the transcendence. Or, as Acker put it in her puzzling book, I dream of the torment that will carry me over the edge and make me act without considering the action. I dream of having a body and it and thinking being one monster. I suggest that we can think of Krauss and Acker's performances of female monstrosity as distinct but related performances of lying down in the stereotype, to borrow a phrase from Claudia Rankin, as efforts to engage with the typical order, with the typical in order to make structural oppression palpable. And I guess we can also call them performances of laying down with the stereotype. But in any case, they are also doing more than merely revealing or calling our attention to the way these types capture the body, burden it, pin it down to a patriarchal ideology, both pleasurably and painfully. And it seems to me that thinking about their work in relation to the artist novel helps us to see this. Literary scholar Deborah Barker has argued that the character of the female painter became important to female novelists interested in the artist novel genre, who sought to push back against the idea of the scribbling women. She, she suggests that because the female painter has a slightly different set of minoritizing conventions to wrestle with in the field of visual art, this hypothetical figure has been used to counter negative stereotypes of feminine authorship in the literary realm. For instance, the female painter would have to deal more explicitly with the idea of the male gaze and the construction of the female body as a visual fetish. I'm interested in this idea that a novelistic assemblage of multiple types of creative figures can accomplish something in excess of establishing a gender-defined, legitimizing claim to insider status, which it clearly also does. I'm interested in how it can afford the female authorial persona a means of reorganizing the stumbling blocks placed in her way by a white supremacist patriarchal system, how it speaks to a different kind of codification of the gendered body. Both in I Love Dick, this Peter one says, I would like to avoid Xanax and therapists for now. I'm hoping that, or hopping that hugs will get me through another year. <laughs> Both in I Love Dick and to some extent in the very recent after Kathy Acker, Chris Krauss summons a host of different kinds of female artists and presents them to her reader in many different registers. They appear as martyrs, role models, frenemies. They are also engaged in many different kinds of aesthetic endeavors. They are painters, sculptors, novelists, photographers, video artists, rock stars, poets, and performance artists. They are appropriators of the gaze, usurpers of the universal eye or I, objects of the gaze, empty facades, whalers, semiotic fields, unthinking copyists, withholders of meaning, master storytellers. 
Krauss gives us Hannah Wilk and Kathy Acker, and also Faith Wildeen, Emmy Hennings, Janis Joplin, George Sand, Diane De Prima, Alice Notley, and Cindy Sherman. And Chris is sensitive, insightful, but also encyclopedic, encyclopedic and compulsive recital of these artists, variously monstrous relations to men and other women. I get the sense that there might be a pattern or a master plan for defeating the patriarchy if Chris just kept the list going, the letters to Dick flowing from her fingers. In Acker's work, among many, many kinds of characters, creative women like Erica Jong and the Bronte sisters become the mouthpieces through which we readers get impersonations that feel variously so personal and impersonal that each taints the other and interpretively the reader is left without any solid ground to stand on. A few years after the Erica Jong, after Erica Jong appeared in the exuberant guise of her character Fanny, impersonating her wishful idea of a woman in the pages of Vogue, that magazine shrugged its shoulders at Acker's bisexual impersonations of the likes of William Burroughs, Patti Smith, and Charles Dickens, saying that her talent is inseparable from compulsive self-promotion. That's a quote. <laughs> the Vogue writer means compulsive to land negatively, assuming it taints free creativity or a true authorial agency. But I've started to think, I've started to think that it's precisely the compulsive quality of the repertoire of artistic poses constructed in the works of Krauss and Acker that is instructive here. I asked earlier about the conditions necessary for artistic gesture or performance that does not abide by conventional standards of success to be legible as such. Perhaps something of an answer lies in the quality of relentlessness communicated by the succession of different but related artistic poses that the texts of Krauss and Acker evoke, each pose having a different relation to the bodies of reader and writer as they insistently invoke a diverse array of media and genres and consuming collectivities. It's a sort of impersonal insistence built out of the accumulation of inadequate subject positions. Each pose points to a distinct approach to cultural politics, a different take on the aesthetic conventions that give us a common culture, as well as common, though differently felt, problems. In the compulsory dance of positionality that these new narrative texts intensify, a dance sometimes pleasurable, sometimes unbearably inconvenient, we are constantly drawn together, then apart on familiar mappings of the social. If we keep moving through it together, maybe the relentless repetition will produce something new for us to have in common. Maybe not, but at least we, you and me, won't be stuck in just one place. Thank you. Um, I originally had said how daunting it was going to be to present a paper on Chris Kraus in front of Chris Kraus, but um, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, we miss her, but it's a little bit freeing. Um, so this is, yeah, this is my piece, Fellow Traveler Chris Kraus. Um, critics these days tend to view Chris Kraus in a vacuum. Or rather, her lineage is acknowledged by presenting the theorists that form her political positions within the text. Deleuze and Guattari, Walter Benjamin, and Georges Lukács, among others. Then there are the French auto-fictionists, such as Hervé Guibert, Georges Perec, Colette, Flaubert, Proust, amongst others. Yet the new narrative movement was part of the influence behind these influences as points of reference that, as Kevin Killian and Dodie Bellamy write, was a lot of California and a lot of France. Part of their aim was to be writers based in theory, inserting their own narratives within academic texts while also embracing certain novelists. To do this, they often combined, or rather aligned their writing with European literary and social theorists. They sought to bring their experiences as marginalized members of society, gay, working class, or women, to the page as narrative, often exposing the intimate details of their personal lives as performative philosophy. They saw life itself as a text and freely used literature that influenced them as easily as they wrote about their own lives, which created a space for writers to perform negotiations between their bodies and the page by combining the personal and the theoretical. As a hybrid of the two, they often situated themselves within each other's work as well, using their lives as texts and regarded each other with name checks and references to create an insular encyclopedia of a certain avant-garde. 
I originally cited examples and then an edit I got back was like, they all know, you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to cite it. But um, from there, as we know, their ideology spread like smoke down to Los Angeles, all the way east to New York. What Krauss inherited from them was a system of thought and influence that focused on these same concepts. Collage, personal narrative, and transgression. We've had a whole panel on new narrative and community already, but I will provide a few definitions of the movement by new narrative writers. Robert Gluck writes in Long Note on New Narrative that Lord Lukash's theory of the novel identifies a narrative form as a community of collaboration and discourse to narrative that questions itself. Jody Bellamy writes in Incarnation that it stems out of a primordial desire to merge. You see something you like and you consume it. In Sex Writing in the New Narrative, Kevin Killian describes Sam D'Alessandro's work as corruption of the body of the text of the story. Narrative is a faulty analog for our experiences. By using other writers in their own work, they created a day collage, text chopped up and reworked to fit a different narrative, funneling down the rough material that their words sought to encapsulate. Beginning with canonical writers and then moving through their contemporaries and friends, they sought to blow open identity by intertwining themselves through connection after connection. Perhaps my definition of the movement is redundant, but it does introduce part of Chris Krause's emergence as a writer nearly 20 years after the birth of New Narrative. While the original New Narrative writers were all in the Bay Area, a crew of New York writers were also integrating theory of praxis into their own writing. This genealogy of New Narrative is intertwined with the development of Krause's early writings, specifically her first two novels. She is both a fellow traveler, as Gluck describes writers close to the movement who did not originate in his workshop, and a direct descendant. I Love, novel, I Love, I Love Dick was a novel about everybody and an encapsulation of many of the new narrative philosophies in one text. Theory as narration, gossip as theory, memoir as ideology, and the porousness between self and other. A large allegorical message of I Love Dick is that personal life happens within a social system. Thus, her position as a writer is also based on a marginal identity. She writes about her personal life synonymously with her political one. Dear Dick, I want to make the world more interesting than my problems, therefore I have to make my problems social. She unites herself with the new narrative position that to write about yourself was a radical political stance if one was not a straight white male. Therefore, writing about gossip, emotion, and desire served radical possibilities because, as Gluck wrote, in writing about sex, desire, and the body, new narrative approached performance art, where self is put at risk by naming names, becoming naked, making the irreversible happen. The book becomes social practice that is lived. Krauss performed for her readers making the personal into, into a discourse and embodying the ideology that personal experience is worthy of intellectual analysis. Her politicization and performativity of emotion in her book served as a narrative of her own experience by utilizing the personal eye as a gateway to relating to a universal system. Krauss's second novel, Aliens and Anorexia, follows a similar formula of easing in and out of her personal narrative to connect to her reading of contemporary culture. The book floats from subject to subject, an acid trip in Southern California that serves as an homage to Walter Benjamin, a BDSM relationship with a man named Gavin, and the, prediction, the production of her film, Gravity and Grace, based on Simone Weil's text with the same name. Theory and narration clash against the self as she writes in first person. In Gluck's short synopsis on aliens and anorexia, um, originally published in Small Press Traffic's newsletter and then reprinted in his 2015 analogy, um, he argues that the book is both a contemporary, a reading of contemporary culture and a performance. Uh, he writes, this is true hybrid writing in which a whole genre can become autobiography by virtue of the author's engagement. The novel does two things at once, for it is a reflection of the outside world, situating herself around them. Instead of utilizing the many theorists she drops into the book to describe her social condition, she puts them in conversation with each other and situates herself between them. 
It is an it, it is an excerpt from I Love Dick that marks the end of the new narrative anthology, Writers Who Love Too Much. The book, Kevin Killian and Dodie Bellamy write, marked a culmination of many years of experiment and forced a sea of change in new narrative, a new paradigm. It's a book that has had a steady stream of influence on writers since its original publication and has inspired a new realm of auto-fictionists that have come forward in the past decade or so. But what struck me upon reading the anthology was the way its arc mirrors that of I Love Dick. The new narratives, as I've said, were a self-referencing bunch, and the anthology shows how their writing, and by extension their lives, uses it in and out of similitude. Um, the anthology obviously contains a strong we. Many of them love Bataille. Both Gluck and Krauss have a dog named Lily. Many of them, Kathy Burkhart, Chris Krauss, and Gary Indiana, write about fucking a man named Dick. Um, then in a true Bataille twist, writing about sex becomes synonymous with writing about death in response to the AIDS epidemic. As Killian writes in an homage to Sam D'Alessandro, the transgression of new narrative writing was a byproduct of the struggle to kill narrative while desiring words to live past life. Similarly, as much as I Love Dick is said to be about sex, it is also about death. Published after the first wave of AIDS, and as Bellamy and Killian point out, around the loss of Bob Flanagan and Kathy Acker, several dead writers important to the movement are name-checked, as if she, like Bellamy and Killian, is standing on a graveyard. Dig a little deeper, or just keep track of names, and you'll find David Wachnerowicz, David Rattray, Jim Brody, and Kathy Acker. Though she's only mentioned once, the reference feels jarring as she describes a note that says, to Silver, to Silver, her husband, the best fuck in the world, at least to my knowledge, love Kathy Acker. The novel contains a layer of processing pain by seeking to become altruistic. To accomplish a reading of global empathy, she uses the first person, the public eye, and flattens her identity by processing her own pain. To describe how she grapples with this distinction, I will focus on a few of her brief passages that describe her Crohn's disease, a topic I've been very taken with. In I Love Dick, she writes, in Minneapolis when I collapsed with Crohn's disease after re realizing Silver didn't love me, I lay on a stranger's couch, feverish and doubled up with pain, hallucinating through swirling particles to a face behind my face. Before they stuck the tubes down through my nose, I knew I wasn't anywhere. Here, as she becomes ill, she retreats into her bodily pain and what is happening inside of her, that her personal identity, the self, is temporarily lost. This is a deep dive into her internal world from the antibodies that trigger her autoimmune condition inside her body all the way back out again. The personal I disappears and what we are left with in this description, briefly, is a porously open body free of identity. She exper experiments with the boundaries of internal versus external because this loss of identity comes from within and the result of her description temporarily leaves readers with no I at all. Her further wish to disintegrate identity is depicted in Aliens and Anorexia when she writes, each person is at each moment capable of remembering all that has ever happened to him and of perceiving everything that is happening <coughs> everywhere in the universe. She lays out a flat, open expanse of possibility, a hollow description of self that matches her description of her sick body, laying the groundwork for absorption and altruism. However, 35 pages earlier, she describes the universe as an information system based on the Gnostics' belief that the dead were symbiotically absorbed among the living, discontinuing, discontinuing the traditional concept of time and removing identity from the body. Therefore, she writes, each person, each person is capable not just of perceiving everything at once, but of becoming other people. The new narrative movement was also an in interconnected network of writers that began to take shape as an information system, a database before the complete dawning of the internet age. They absorbed each other, like the Gnostics, Krauss is also absorbing those that came before her. 
while she is also reaching out to inhabit other people in a mechanism that is described as altruism, she is also laying herself open to her readers by blowing open the personal eye. The performative confession of each individual new narrative writer put them at risk, leaving them exposed. But, as Steve Abbott writes, if the writer's life is more open to judgment and speculation, so is the reader's. This is hyperbolically true of Krauss's work. Her writing, specifically I Love Dick, garners attention while reading in public. The plot line says something about its readers for both in those in and out of the know. Others' lives have situated um, as an information system around the book. As Liz Kinnaman recently wrote in the LA Review of Books, it is difficult to see a stranger reading the book in public without the urge to share one's own experience with it. A man at a magazine party told me he could not get through it because he could not identify with the masochism of the main character. By telling him that I had read it and liked it, I revealed that I could. So I will make my own confession. It would be unfair to talk about the bodily subjectivity of Krauss and the new narrative writers if I did not confess to my own motives because my sick obsession with their bodily subjectivities derives from having first read I Love Dick on a hospital bed. I'm a desiring machine, a shitting machine, or a pulsion machine, a sick girl, a bookish girl, always hungry, always anxious, a crazy cerebral girl, examining the cycle of my own degradation in my personal relationships. And like Krauss, I also have Crohn's disease. It attacks your digestive tract, appearing as a physical manifestation of weight loss, bruises, sallow skin, and thinning hair. It's chronic, lying dormant until a flare-up, a bad part of a whole. Large stretches of time, years, go by until I'm chucked onto a conveyor belt of bodily malfunction, spiraling downwards with high fever and intense cramps. The waves of pain come on so gradually until suddenly, they are too intense to be ignored, resulting in a hospital stay, throwing up blood, shitting water. It's my pattern, my code, my algorithm to hit rock bottom in a haze of blood, bile, fluid, and bounce back up after the inevitable hospital visit, where they inject me with steroids, medication, enemas, until my insides are whole again. I'm packing plastic, loading needles into my blown out veins, an immunosuppressant junkie, not just a sick girl, but a prescription zombie, a pre-existing insurance nightmare, drip. <laughs> The book urges you to draw parameters of your own personal narrative. In those brief descriptions of Crohn's that she gives, I felt as if I had become her as a passive fellow traveler, trapped by many degrees of separation. To describe her Crohn's, she writes in Aliens and Anorexia, it is a question of control. Sometimes the inflammation wins, and when it does, I lay under it. There is no vacancy. Despot, despair is her trigger, blurring the lines between the mental and the physical. But in the same paragraph, she transitions her focus to an unnamed friend dying of AIDS. She loans him money, he shows her around the apartment he's cleaning, and instead of completing the sentence that will complete the scene, she goes, bang, I'm in the hospital for five days. The gap in language transform, transports her from various spaces, from the apartment to the hospital, and various gazes, from objective to subjective. It is an incomplete narrative that she disconnects and then blends together. Location and identity collapse in on each other as she witnesses his suffering and seemingly involuntarily connects it with her own. Her gaze is transfixed on him and the specific surroundings of the apartment he is showing her until the bang obliterates the organization of her prose. Thus, empathy first derives from within the depths of her own organs. Here, bang is a trigger word, an explos explosion blasting open her prose. The distribution, the dis disruption signals a breaking point, both of form in the book and of body. In the beginning was the word, so they say, but what if this bang acted like the big bang, obliterating the borders of consciousness? She unites malabsorption, which happens during Crohn's, with porousness, a pastiche of new narrative. The internal is pushed to the surface, and we are left with non-retentive matter, permeable to the outside. 
Imagine the literary mechanism of porousness and the porous nature of a sick body channeling to the internal and external as bodily mechanisms. The bile, blood, and puke that float out while she is sick. Drawings from Simone Weil, she writes, the panic of altruism, sadness rests inside the body, always gnashing like the inflammation of a chronic disease. Here, she removes any ownership of the self and describes abject states of being as channels to tap into. Altruism is the panic. Sadness is inside the body, the inflammation of a chronic disease. To tap into al altruism is not to extend outside of yourself. She describes it as a loop. There isn't any separation anymore between what you are and what you see. The hollowness of her illness, I think, is a form of empathy, as she combine, combines pain and content through a reordering of prose. Her very own border is disintegrated into the outside world. As Artaud wrote in To Have Done With the Judgment of God, man was given two paths, that of the infinite without, and that of the infinitesimal within. Man chose within, but perhaps we are still waiting for the outside. The name of uh, this paper is, oh, I'm uh, Anna uh, Vitali and um, the name of this paper is Suicidal Fantasy and the name of the author, Amiri Baraka and Kathy Acker. And this work grows out of uh, my dissertation, um, which is called Suicidal Fantasy in Three American Authors. And I write about Amiri Baraka and Kathy Acker and David Wojnarowicz and their use of the proper name uh, or a, f a figure or metaphor for the proper name. Uh, like, I, I, don't, I don't talk about David Wojnarowicz in this paper, but I write about his uh, series of photographs in which he uses the um, face of Rimbaud to cover the face of the person in the photograph, and I think of that as like a, a metaphor for the proper name. Uh, so you can ha have that somewhere uh, in your mind. Uh, I'm really happy to be presenting this work. I haven't uh, ever had a chance to share this work with really anyone but friends, and my uh, committee is a really large audience, and I think it's an honor to be here. What are we doing when we name names? Kathy Wagner poses this question in her sharp-witted epistolary essay in From Our Hearts to Yours, New Narrative on Contemporary Practice. I want to use this space to think, she writes, as calmly as I can about what you are trying to do when you name names. Here, the addressee, new narrator, is both us and not us, and Wagner is perhaps herself and also certainly not writing, I'm the one who carries the name of, no, I won't name myself here, because as the Sufi saying hints, I'm not identical with my name. Part of this is familiar. The narrative I refers to an author, but not the author, and always more and or less than that. And yet this new narrative tactic, as Rob Halpern and Robin Trevely McGaw refer to it in From Our Hearts to Yours, also sets in motion a series of uncertainties regarding the author's identification. Here, inquiry into what we are doing when we name names bends backwards and points to an unidentifiable author. From uncertainty about the author's name unfolds questions about identity, where identity engages how identification, and by identification I mean the uh, way that we um, have inner attachments, so in like a psychoanalytic sense, um, are made of parts of, of other people, kind of whether we like it or not. Uh, so from uncertainty about the author's name unfolds questions about identity, where identity engages how identification 
psychical inner attachments intersect with politics and culture. Wagner's question then about what we are doing when we name names can be rephrased in order to highlight how naming names can be an expression of identification. What is an author doing when they refer to their identity by way of refusal? No, I won't name myself here. What are you doing when you identify yourself through and with erasure? Amiri Baraka and Kathy Acker suggest that identifying oneself through erasure is a way to mediate, create space around constraining forms of identity. The life and death stakes of naming names, of pointing to how one is distinct from their identifications, becomes clearest when Acker and Baraka name names in the context of suicidal fantasy. The majority of Acker's novels tell us of a mother who committed suicide, and her narrators often wonder whether they should take their life like their mother or do something completely different. Baraka's first book uh, is called Preface to a 20-volume Suicide Note, one of the most extraordinary titles of a book, I think, ever. Uh, preface to a 20-volume Suicide Note. I think I'll always wonder what, what that looks like, because um, it's so imaginative and outside of the, the book itself. Uh, and his second book, The Dead Lecturer, also speaks to the suicidal fantasy of the author. And I mean the author that's um, made in the work that Baraka Acker and even Vornarovich are, are making uh, figures of authors in, 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 their, in their works. In the following examples, Acker and Baraka name names in a way that makes it difficult to know if the author is beckoning or resisting suicidal fantasy, and that's probably not an, an or kind of situation. Uh, and again, I just want to say that the concept of Fantasy here allows us to focus on the text and the way that authors think what it is to be an author in the thing that they make, and not about or when or if or how Acker or Baraka or anyone was uh, suicidal. I couldn't say anything with authority about that and, and wouldn't want to try since they can't tell us themselves now uh, in the way that um, I would need them to in order to be persuaded by uh, you know, other, other judgments. Anyway, I consider the repetition of the mother's suicide across Acker's novels, between her narrators, and among her biographical anecdotes as a form of excessive identification. Too much likeness, not enough difference between texts and people. In Baraka, this will be something that suicidal fantasy helps us to escape. In Acker, however, suicidal fantasy is never different enough, and Acker uses plagiarism, a way of naming other authors, in order to show the need for something other than identification. I don't know if that exists. I, I think it does. Great Expectations, her novel from 1981, her novel, both begins and ends with a mother's suicide. The first page reads, one, plagiarism. I recall my childhood, my father's name being Perup and my Christian name Philip and my infant t and my Christian name Philip, my infant tongue could make of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Peter. So I called myself Peter and came to be called Peter. I give Perup as my father's family name on the authority of his tombstone and my sister, Mrs. Joe Gargery, who married the blacksmith. On Christmas Eve 1978, my mother committed suicide, and in September of 1979, my grandmother on my mother's side died. Ten days ago, it is now almost Christmas 1979, Terence told my fortune with tarot cards. This was not so much a fortune, whatever that means, but a fairly, it seems to me, precise psychic map of the present, therefore the future. In Great Expectations, Acker's plagiarism of Dickens's novel points both away from and towards the author. Robert Gluck describes, quote, the effect of Acker's quote marks, which was, he writes, to slide me back and forth between embrace and distance. 
We all know Acker didn't write the real Great Expectations. Pip is not Acker's character, neither is Mrs. Joe Gardry, but we also know that Peter is not Dickens's character, and Pip is not Peter. So the arrow that pointed away now points back. There's a distance, and here's an embrace, or there's an embrace, and here is a distance. Who is Peter Acker's lover? What best defines this narrator, who is not Pyrrhic, not Pip, not Philip, not the real Peter, not Kathy with a Y, or Kathy with an I, or Acker, is all that they cannot be identified by or with, no positive forms of identification. And every time I read that phrase, no positive forms of identification, I always want to say please at the end. <laughs> no positive forms of identification, please. I don't know why it needs like a, a begging after. Um, this is the act of naming the author uh, by way of refusal. This narrator has, uh, on the one hand, and here's that slip between narrator and author that I think is constitutive of all of the work we've been thinking through. Uh, on the one hand, there's too much identity, too many names, and on the other hand, not enough. None of the names are quite right. The story of A, the mother's suicide, follows too much of not enough, which leads to a timeline where events are not distinct from each other, where all points in time run together. How is Acker different from her narrator in the context of a mother's suicide? Mom's suicide, grandma's death, and the tarot card reading all point to the same thing in the first two paragraphs of this story, the end. When the recollections of childhood depend on plagiarism and suicide, Acker suggests there is no future other than the one that insists on foreclosure, the, quote, precise psychic map of the present, therefore the future, reflects all that came before. Here, the identification of lots of characters and people returns the author as disappeared, dispersed, and the consolidation of names and time both things that could produce distinction leaves the author nowhere to go with nothing to do. And I think there are a lot of other ways to, to read Acker, um, and I do think about Acker in a lot of different ways. Um, but this is one, one way. So the risk in Acker is often the loss of distinction, too much identification. Acker's narrators identify and disidentify with the suicidal mother in ways that make being outside of the economy of identification seem completely implausible. Does the mother ever have a name? Maybe naming her would make her smaller. Leaving her named only as mother keeps her solid, strong, totally dead. What is needed is a real break, a deep disidentification, some kind of language or act that would be different enough to be meaningful. Amiri Baraka's preface to a 20-volume suicide note, which is 20 years before uh, Great Expectations, or many, many years after, uh, <laughs> begins in a similar way uh, to Acker's Great Expectations. Suicidal fantasy inaugurates the text, and an author emerges by way of identification uh, of and with others through the proper name. The opening poem to preface is a dedication to Hetty Jones, which is titled, uh, This Book is Hetty's. The poem is never discussed by those writing about preface, and the complete absence of the poem, This Book is Hetty's, from everywhere but the original Totem Press editions suggests that there is something here that we have not been able to address. Jones, at the time, appropriated the first poem in his first book, and it is a poem that names names, and it is about suicide and identification. This book is Hetty's, is among other things, a poem that goes by the dalliance of the leopards, printed in colored stars versions of 50 Asiatic love poems in 1919. So the very first poem in Baraka's first book is this citation of this poem from this weird book uh, that, it's just, it's totally strange uh, to me. Um, and, uh, and I don't even remember how I figured out that it wasn't something that he wrote, except that it says, from the Sanskrit at the bottom. Um, but, like, there's no other reference to it. Um, 
and I, I love him for this strangeness. Uh, as an appropriated poem, this book is Hedy's demonstrates the impossibility of unambivalently identifying as the sole author of, of this book. This book is Hedy's. The 1919 publication of The Dalliance of Leopards lacks any identification of, of the author. Uh, Baraka takes this absence one step further when he strips the poem of its historical reference. So when you go to the uh, 1919 uh, copy, you see that it says uh, 5th century and from the Sanskrit, but Baraka strips uh, his own version of it uh, from the 5th century, and we just get this weird from the Sanskrit. Uh, so he disidentifies with what situates the poem in time. Yet when the poet retains from the Sanskrit, he refers American readers to the East, an unidentified faraway place, quotes, uh, potentially outside of the bind of being a black English-speaking American author, someone identified with their nation, race, and language, rather than something else. The poem is interested in disidentification even as it ushers in uh, an affiliation with Hetty Jones. That's a very complicated affiliation, as we, some of us might know. Um, although it is easy enough to interpret, this book is Hetty's as meaning this book is for Hetty. The book is not explicitly for her. Rather, the dedication implies the book belongs to her. The book's ownership is being signed over. The title suggests that we should imagine Baraka passing the book to someone, shunning it even, saying, this book is Hetty's, it's not mine, it doesn't belong to me, it's hers. The poem claims ownership on behalf of someone else by way of a disclaimer, foisting ownership on Hetty who might not want it. A husband tells us his book belongs to his wife, an African-American man tells us his book belongs to a white woman, the dedication does not exactly give something to Hetty, but it gives something back to her. Racialized identification, an undesirable object? We do not know, and the peculiarity of the dedication mobilizes this uncertainty. Ah, now I just want to read the poem for you briefly. It's, it's, it's uh, short here, so, and I'll talk a little bit about the poem, and, and then I'll wrap up. This book is Hetty's. Very afraid. I saw the dalliance of leopards. In the beauty of their coats, they sought each other and embraced. Had I gone between them then and pulled them asunder by their manes, I would have run less risk than when I passed in my boat and saw you standing on a dead tree ready to dive and kindle the river. From the Sanskrit. <laughs> The poem begins, very afraid, I saw the dalliance of leopards. The love-making leopards create a scene of two like beings that the poet imagines dividing, pulling asunder. Where lies the potential in breaking part, apart an embrace? These leopards sound too alive, threateningly so, overly identified with their likeness, their leopardness, their embodiment. The poet imagines separating them by their manes, something else that identifies them with one another. The manes mark being of a kind. They do not have fur, nor hair, nor feathers, but manes. The leopards can be understood as figures for the creation of a community based on likeness that the poet wants to disrupt. There is not enough difference in their formation. The person the poet passes by in a boat, however, is ready to jump, to take their self out of the economy of identification into something that moves, flows, and does not trap like the leopard embrace. Who is the person? Is it meant to reflect Leroy Jones, Hetty, the future Baraka, uh, that's sort of given birth by the killing of, of Jones, uh, composite, another figure? We know only of their position outside, marginal to the leopards, and separate from the speaker in the boat. In the poem, suicidal fantasy intervenes not just as the greater risk, but as the greater promise to individuate and create a more unidentifiable spark. That person is prepared to dive and kindle the river. Does this mean they could set the river on fire? Offer the river the means to be a different element altogether, to be fire, 
The addressee might be ready to be more than him, her, their self. The speaker might be witnessing the start of a rebirth into something unrecognizable. Not belonging to one's self or one's time is a problem that suicidal fantasy wrestles with. On the one hand, the fantasy can involve the assertion that I belong to myself. See, I can take my own life. And on the other hand, I belong to no community because no one can save me. Suicide is one way to set oneself free from having to belong according to understandable, legible criteria. In Notes on Suicide by Simon Critchley, he puts it this way, if the right to suicide flows from some idea of self-ownership, then I would be inclined to say that we do not own ourselves. It is not that we are completely owned by others, but self-possession is something possessed with others alongside them. Yet suicidal fantasy is a way to escape both the notion that one must belong to oneself and the idea that one must be able to identify oneself and thus belong by means of already known forms of identification. Baraka and Acker proposed that one thing we could be doing when we are naming names is dreaming of the end of our life. Another thing, perhaps more importantly, is that we are also imagining and clearing the ground for others to imagine that someone can survive as other than a recognizable, legible self. A name can be a too small house for a body to thrive by. Acker and Baraka name names, name the author through the name of another in the context of suicidal fantasy in order to imagine another more survivable life, one not circumscribed by excessive identification. My argument about these works refers to an overarching ambivalence toward politicized identity, something new narrative and the black arts movement may very well share. I do not know yet. But I am eager to discuss and learn more about suicidal fantasy and works often associated with revolutionary politics and experimental poetics. Thank you. Thank you guys for those fantastic papers. Um, questions we have about uh, 20 more minutes for questions, so please. I don't have a question, but I just want to tell you that, like, a very simple thing, which is that I read Kathy Acker and my team in early 20s, and I was very suicidal all the time during that time, and she helped me to feel like that was part of it was a, it was part of my artistic identity and actually since that time like I work as an artist under many other names so it was funny that you loved that because I said oh, that just totally validates everything that I've experienced. So. So couple of discussions of visual culture. <clears throat> I was wondering if uh, any of you would want to uh, tie some of your discussion to contemporary artists that you're looking at at this time. Um, this is about as contemporary as my work gets. I'm removing out of uh, my dissertation is on mid-century artists, uh, Baldwin, Warhol, some art collectives, and so I'm very excited to, to be in the contemporary of this I haven't quite made it too far past that. It's close enough. <laughs> I don't really have authority to talk about mm -hmm. so I would stay over this one and meditate. Um, well, I mentioned that I've um, written about the David Wendell series, the Rosenbaum series. Um, and uh, I think there would be a, a lot of room to um, wonder, and I'm sure lots of people do, um, about the uh, desire to um, appear or, or disappear in, in visual art and, and performance. Um, 
I, I can only probably say particular things about how I read um, David Warner, which is photographs, um, so that series in particular, um, and, and what other people said about it, which is one, one thing that happens when people talk about those photographs, which if people don't know them, it's their black and white photographs uh, in New York of a man wearing a mask of Arthur Rainbow's face, and um, something that's quite extraordinary about people's desire, critical desire in relation to those photographs is that people say, oh, David Wojnarowicz and Rimbaud, they're like the same person, except separated by like a hundred years. You know, like there's so much in common there. And for me, there's a poverty to that thought because we lose a lot of the desire associated with being really different that say Wojnarowicz and Rimbaud uh, and, and like embodied and expressed in their work. And I'm sure that Wojnarowicz felt very similar to Rimbaud and would say, that, but there's also so much of the desire in that work to like look alone or be alone or just be a, like a really a desire to represent being very very different from everything around you. Like the photographs on Coney Island, are like nobody else was on Coney Island that day, as if Coney Island were like completely abandoned all the time, and the only person that was there was this person wearing this Um So uh, I think that's yeah. I, I don't know what else to say, but I'll say that. Okay. <laughs> Interesting use the word poverty. Oh, what do you want to say about that? Oh, oh you were using it to describe a point of non-connection, but I might use it to draw a connection. Uh huh. Yep. That's a different discussion. No, Sorry, you, you were going to say. Um, well, it's just, uh, I just remembered that um, in my previous work, I thought a little bit about how the artist photograph, as it circulated in, in magazines um, in the 20th century, kind of derived from uh, 19th century conventions of portraiture, you know, the seated kind of um, uh, mid-range portrait in the studio or at the writer's desk. Um, and I hadn't quite gotten to the point of thinking about um, representations of Krauss, Krauss and Acker and um, visual representations of them in photographs in the media. And until this morning, I saw that LRB piece on uh, uh, Krauss's after Kathy Acker, and they had a nice collage of all of these images of Acker that break so completely from those um, uh, 20th century conventions. And I was like, damn it! I could have talked about that, but I just saw it today. Um, I have a question for Laura and Carmen. Um, uh, could you talk a bit about staging your personal life as? Uh, as, a, as a disruption of your discourse and, and your decision to put yourself at risk uh, by, by, by dealing with these disruptive forces? Um, yeah, I think, well, so for Chrome, is Chrome is an autoimmune disorder. Um, and a popular definition is inappropriate uh, reactions. Um, so the fact that something inside of you is inappropriate, um, and Krauss's work, um, kind of especially when it first came out, um, breaking all of these boundaries um, as one of the scandalous books of its time by being inappropriate or inappropriate outbursts about or uh, confessions to Dick, and then also um, the way she skipped over and would kind of go in and out, and her insertions in plays um, also felt kind of like a flare-up um, <laughs> where they're just completely like very sudden. Um, so I thought it might be fitting to just zoom very far in. And zoom very far in. Um, for me, something I've learned from uh, the works I talked about today was uh, the kind of armor that can be created in the impersonal inhabitation of the personal. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so actually I didn't feel myself putting myself at risk or being vulnerable. This is um, inhabiting all these different poses of confession or vulnerability actually made me feel pretty safe today and less anxious than usual even though I'm standing in front of a crowd of you. Um, I'm thinking about um, the last paper on Hacker and Morocco. I, I work on Morocco and 
kind of from like a society and all sorts of things. And I don't know anyone else who is doing that pairing, so it's quite interesting. And um, I'm thinking about the ways in which Jones and then Baraka um, uses Hetty Jones as a character. And I'm thinking about the way that she self-describes Hetty Jones as a character. I wonder if you're thinking about or how you're using some of her texts and how I became Hetty Jones and to use her characterizations of, characterizations of that sort of in conversation with her, if that's of interest to you. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't done that. I'm sure as you know, like right, the dissertation ends up being this like right. <laughs> <laughs> and leaving all other sort of possibilities aside, but I, you know, I really appreciate um, that that thinking, and, and you know, would be really curious to to go, uh, you know, a lot a lot further with it because she does um, appear, you know, really strongly as a, a, a figure in um, that book, preface to a twenty volume suicide note. There's the heady poems, um, but then when the Work gets reproduced, like in um, the re most recent anthologies of, you know, Baraka or even previous ones like Translucency or um, that SOS. Like the Hetty poems get left out. Yeah, yeah. And so you're like, mm, okay, but like that was a really interesting part of the early work. Um, so I bet Hetty Jones herself produces another way to think about that problem or that absence or does. Yeah, yeah. I would love to talk to you more about it. Yeah. Thank you. You had said at the beginning of your piece that Chris Cross was miscategorized a little bit in the way that she was represented, like what particularly the you? Um, yeah, I don't think it's so much that she's misrepresented. I think that new narrative gets um, left out of a lot of her narrative right now, um, especially as everyone knows she's super, super popular right now. So she'll be in Vogue or Cosmo. And, um, a lot of her history uh, doesn't get explained completely. Um, yeah, and then also, I mean, she's part of um, many different groups in the narrative, and then also she was, of course, that there so many of texts and then the founding. So it all kind of gets intertwined. Um, a lot of auto fictionists now will cite her as inspirations, I think, for them, while leaving out a lot of other people that can be important. Yeah. 
I feel like it's a space for imagining what the self is and, is and isn't, right? Like, um, even the way that um, you had your uh, chats, you know, um, um, you know, popping up, and um, in your own turn to uh, autobiography, it was like, a, oh, like, we're gonna we're gonna swerve right now, and it seems like um, digital life enables a kind of infinite number of swerves in relationship to how one pres presents, yeah, presents their work, presents their. Uh, self, self, and, and self, um, almost to the point of like, right, like producing a lot of pan panic. <laughs> um, sometimes I think that. And I think that also, um, it, digital culture has changed the scene of writing. So, like, when I'm writing my dissertation, all of these chats are popping up. I imagine uh, myself to be kind of engaging with the larger conversation in the way that new narrative uh, artists kind of exploded that idea of the solitary. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, I'm thinking about the way you kind of like structured the idea of the part of the minoritarian community as being. You guys hear me? No. Um, sorry. No. So I'm thinking about the way Carmen structured the idea of, of the minoritarian community as being kind of everybody who's not a straight white man, um, but there's a lot of barriers and like subject positions in that community, a lot, a lot of power relations that are operating there, according to like, the desires that we express. Um, and I feel like I heard two different modes of kind of community building emerge from these three papers. Um, one is the idea of the blurred but still visible boundaries, the pink and Latin, and the other is the idea of disintegration, and boundaries that just completely fall apart. <coughs> And I wonder what the ethical stakes are for those different modes of community building among minority subjects. <coughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I didn't want to collapse all forms of difference as um, just like a kind of generalized otherness outside of the kind of white male author. Um, what I was trying to get at in this paper that was mostly focused on gender is um, that I think that what these texts evoke powerfully for me is just uh, a constant mobility and shifting in terms of the identifications that can create these communities. So uh, what I was trying to get at by the bodies moving here and then there together and not together is just how these things are like constantly shaping and they're stable. I mean, I think that disintegration and and, and borderlessness are um, kind of uh, re reconfiguring borders, um, you know, one wonders, um, or I, one wonders, it's so easy to speak like you're still writing a dissertation, um, <laughs> uh, like, oh, okay, so, so what, um, what, you know, what else is there, or, um, are there positive forms of identification that are desirable or sustainable, um, do you need some kind of like it, you know, a, a, a set interference or restructuring of the borders or this this kind of disintegration because there's something intolerable about about in integration. Um, I don't know, and we can very much ask that question about um, uh, you know race in the United States. Not uh, you know, I don't know for what group uh, integration is uh, intolerable, but it seems like uh, for for some group out there um, and. Yeah, I think it's a really good question, um, and I don't know how to answer it. Um, do you have thoughts uh, about this? No, it's, the it's a question. I have no answer for it. I yeah. always go back to that, that one case study, and I love Dick, that's um, titled This Is in the Life of a Slave Girl, mm -hmm. um, where Krauss has been implying that some kind of like commensurability between herself and Harriet Jacobs. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that chapter always tripped me up. So I'm like, 
those are not commensurable with situations at all. But you, you want to sort of leave it to me that the like, kind of reputation or like cycling through names is still a viable strategy for identification, like community building, even with the next situation. Um, but it, it, it's like really fast and difficult to, to think for it. It is really difficult, and that's, that's kind of, uh, it's, it seemed like a reference a little bit to like really early feminists, like Mary Wollstonecraft, who would do that. Um, I would compare uh, herself and the, the struggle with white women to the struggle of slaves. Um, it is a really um, uncomfortable question of, of identity that I think that Chris really layers. I think there's so many references to Anglophone that return that book as well. Um, but it's like super like hundreds of years later. And Acker does that too. Uh, Acker very much uh, identifies with um, slaves and slavery in the, in the, in the novels and her, yeah, her, her orphans are also slaves a lot of the time and there's a, a lot to wonder about that. Um, not in a good way or bad way, just like a, a what way, right? Okay. Or, yeah. yeah. We've got five more minutes for remaining questions. Can I ask a little clarification? Did you, Ishmael, just say minoritarian? Yes. Is that the first time that word's been said today on this panel? I don't think so. I think I used that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Anna, you said, uh, what are we doing when we name names? That was a title from Kathy. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a question that uh, Kathy Wagner asks um, in the new um, From Our Hearts Studios uh, collection. And that it's not the name of the essay, but that's the question of the essay. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I, this morning I was reading, so I love Dick. And um, at the end of one of the chapters, uh, she quotes from Dick's book, Aliens and Anorexia, which is, of course, you know, her next book, Criss Cross's next book. Um, and as the three of you were speaking, there were a few phrases that started constellating around my confusion and my subsequent Googling of this, you know, that did Dick actually write Aliens and Anorexia? No. Criss Cross, yes. Um, but this idea of taking up, um, along with, uh, new narratives project of the single white or, or of the it's okay to write about the first person as long as it's not a single white no sorry straight white man <laughs> um, i'm thinking of single white female um, straight white yeah. man um and uh as well as uh uh Winterovich's use of rambo's face so those were three things that have been kind of circling around this and i'm wondering about this case of attributing one's own work to a figure like Dick. What, how does that fit into, you, in your eyes, um, or six eyes, um, uh, this ki the kind of project that New Narrative is doing? Um, this is a real confusion that I'm having. So. I wanted to throw it in there. I mean, for me, that moment in I Love Dick is a very powerful moment. You know, the first time I read it, I felt kind of confused about the power relations and, and how that was working, but that moment stood out to me as a very powerful moment of Chris, uh, like, performing her projection and her ability to kind of put the mask over Dick's face or whatever mask that she wants. I don't know, that's how I've always read that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the themes of alien, aliens and anarchists are already in the island, and I think that um, show a lot of material, and that's how aliens and anarchists ended up being written as a book. Um, but it did seem kind of like a powerful moment because the real thing, as we all know, like, did write an important book of cultural criticism at the time. Um, but she doesn't name that at all or ever. Um, so it was like she was, it was, she was seeing herself in that moment too, um, reflecting her own things on without ever really acknowledging it. 
Uh, and with that, we're out of time. Uh, thank you guys for, for joining.